Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the semester exam review. If you want to do it, it's not mandatory. Please make sure that you add your name to it because when you turn this in, I'm not going to see y'all again and I'm not going to know whose paper is whose. I need you to have your name. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin and look at it. It's a possible 10 points if it's done. It needs to be turned in before you take your test, not after. And let's start off with number one, circular motion. So let's talk about that first because it's been a while since we've looked at that. It says here that the circle to the right is moving in a counterclockwise direction. Now counterclockwise direction is going to be what we call positive and also it's going to be moving this way. So let's go ahead and I'm going to label it and I'm just going to just draw some arrows just so that way I keep up with the direction it's moving counterclockwise. Now, part A says, label the arrows that show or demonstrate centripetal force with a capital F. Okay, centripetal or centripedial means center seeking. Centrifugal means center fleeing. So, it's going to be center seeking or in the middle. F, 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 and F. Part B says, label the arrow that shows centripetal acceleration. They use the word centripetal again, so that means that it's going to be going inward. So A, 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 and A. And then the last one here says, well, let's look at the tangent velocity and let's label it with a V. So V, 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 and V. Okay, let's keep going. A Ferris wheel, it says here, is 100 meters across. That means that that's the full way, and we need just the diameter, not um, just the radius, probably not just that full diameter, okay? We haven't used diameter ever on any of our equations, radius. So I'm going to change the number to 50 meters because that is the radius number. And it's spinning with a frequency of 0.02 hertz. What is the tangent velocity of this cart here? So the tangent velocity, which is on our formula chart right over here, is tangent velocity equals 2 pi r over period. Now, I don't have period. I have the radius. I know pi is 3.14. 2 is a constant. But I don't have period. So I'm going to come over here first, and I'm going to have to do step 1. Step one is going to be find the period. T equals one over F, and they gave me F, so one over 0.02. So let's do that first step. Clear one divided by 0.02 actually equals 50. So let's get that number plugged in over here. So it's going to be two times 3.14 times 50 for the radius, not the diameter, divided by the period, which so happens to be 50 also. You're going to get your answer in meters per second. Now it's saying, well, what's the centripetal acceleration of that cart? So centripetal acceleration has an equation. My centripetal acceleration equation is tangent square or tangent velocity square over radius. So we're going to be writing down centripetal acceleration is VT squared over R. So whatever this number is, we're going to plug it in over here. Don't forget to square it over R, which is 50. So put your number over here and square it. You're going to get your answer in meters per second squared. The next one says, well, what what would the centripetal acceleration be if the speed was to double? That means you're going to get this number, multiply it by 2. So I'm going to get this number right here, bring it over here, times it by 2. Then you're going to plug this in over here. And don't forget to square it over 50. Okay, so continue to follow along. That way you can make sure that you're answering it correctly. I told you in class, I'm telling you again, I am not going to solve the problems. I will set you up. 
if the card has a mass of 200 kilograms, what is the centripetal force F sub C? So the centripetal force is going to be the same equation that we have, F equals MA, and so F equals MA, but this is centripetal acceleration. Don't forget that. On our formula chart, all we have is F equals MA. But don't forget, you're going to use the same equation. M is going to be 200. It's in kilograms, so that's a good SI unit. And we're going to multiply it by this acceleration number. Equals your answer in newtons. Let me come back over here. This number is going to be plugged in there. Okay, let's keep going. Now a tire rotates 26 times in two seconds. If it's um, experiencing a tangent velocity of 120 meters per second, well, what's the radius of the tire? Tangent velocity equals two pi r over t. Did they give us t? They did not give us t. So we're gonna have to come over here and do step one first. Step one is going to be, since I don't have frequency like this up here, I'm going to go ahead and say the number of waves over the time, or 26 divided by 2, All right? And so that's going to be our step 1. That ends up being 13, and they gave us the velocity. We're looking for radius, so let's go ahead and put it in our, plug in our numbers, 120, oops, equals 2 times 3.14 times r over does the 13 come over here i think i said it a minute ago yes but i if i did i apologize this is actually the frequency number so now we're going to get this number come over here i'm going to call this step 2 which is t equals 1 over f or 1 over 13 and we're going to get this number right here and we're gonna plug it in over here, okay? You're gonna use this equation to solve for the radius. A blade on a garbage disposal rotates at an angular speed of 25 rads per second. Angular speed. I apologize, it's like that weird W. It's an omega sign. How long will it take, question mark T, for the blade to rotate 16 pi rads? Okay, that's the angular displacement. So let's go ahead and write down the equation. Angular speed, which is omega equals theta over T. So angular displacement is right here. We're going to go ahead and Plug our numbers in, and we're going to say 25 equals 16 pi over t. That means multiply the 16 times 3.14, okay? Solve for t. Your answer is going to be in seconds. All right, I'm going to get away from there, and let's come over here. Let's do a little bit of this, and let's see if we can remember. How many pi rads are in one rotation around a circle? Now, I'm going to go back to our circles. And we have a half of a circle, which is called pi, which is also called 3.14. Okay, that's one pi. Then we have this one little slice. Do we remember? One, two, three, and a little extra. And that's where we get the 3.14s. Now, pi rad is a whole half of a circle. A rad is just going to be one little slice of the cake, of the pie. So they want to know how many pi rads are in one full rotation. Well, I see a half of a circle and a second half, so there's two. How many radians are in one rotation around a circle? 
my radian or my rad is the piece of the pi. And within a half a circle, there's one, two, three, point one four. And the other half is one, two, three, point one four. So my answer is six point two eight. Radians or rads? The next one. How many pi radians are in two rotations? So four pi rads. How many radians are in two rotations? Remember, there's a difference between pi rads or pi radians and radians, okay? So now, if there is 6.28 in one full rotation, so let's get 6.28, multiply it by two, which equals 12.56 rad, okay? I'm gonna skip a little bit because we gotta, gotta keep going. It says here, a girl swinging on a merry-go-round and moves counterclockwise. Just tossing that out there. Don't forget, counterclockwise is a positive direction. Through an arc length of, all right, arc length is going to be a lowercase s. If the girl's angular displacement is, and that's the theta, how far is she from the center of the merry-go-round? So we're looking for radius. So in this case, angular displacement theta equals arc length over radius. You have your angular displacement, which is 1.67 equals, let's come over here and put 2.5 over R and let's solve for R. My answer is going to be in meters. Okay. Let's keep going. Protractors. You're going to need to bring your protractor or I have protractors in the classroom, your choice. Not sure which one you're going to use. Okay, but I do have some. But don't forget, protractors. What do I do, Miss Munson? Because that arrow is not big enough. I cannot see. And it's on the edge of the paper. That's okay if it's on the edge of the paper. In that case, let's go ahead and get another sheet of paper. And we're just going to go ahead and extend it. So I'm going to get another piece of paper, extend that line out, and then I can solve for it. There it is. I extended it out. Now, don't forget, when you're going through this, we always start over here at zero degrees. And then it goes to 90 degrees, 180, 270, back to 360 degrees, one full rotation. If I start at zero and I go all the way over here, that's at least 180 degrees. Now, if I measure this little piece right here, I'm gonna add it to 180. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my protractor. I'm gonna work with it upside down. And remember this line right here is to help me so that way I can measure it up with this line. My up and down arrows, my Y axis is going to be lining up right here. So in that case, I can see that my line comes all the way out over here. Now, I'm gonna start off with 10 because I know that I'm starting off at zero. 10, 11, 12, 13. Now, if this is 13 degrees, I'm gonna add it to 180 because my actual rotation starts over here and goes all the way to there. So in that case, then I'm gonna have um, 180 plus 13, so 193 degrees. But now we need to convert it to radians. So to convert from degrees to radians, it's on our formula chart. You're going to get the degree number, which is 193. Multiply it by pi, and then divide it by 180. Okay, so then go ahead and do that so you can plug it in over here. And do it for the other two, but you need to practice using the protractor. Let's turn the page. Please know that I'm going to need to be skipping around and I'm not going to do all of it for you. It says here, number one, modern cars are designed to have a crumple zone in order to, why? 
increase the stop time so the force decreases. They are inversely proportional. When one goes up, the other goes down. Let's go ahead and look at a couple of questions over here and then we'll move on to the next section. It says that a bullet is traveling at a velocity of 900 meters per second towards a building and it has a momentum of lowercase p 4.5. What is the mass of the bullet? Question mark m. Well, p equals m times v or 4.5 equals m times 4.5. I forgive me, that's 900. equals, we're looking for mass, so my answer is in kilograms. Now for me to do this, I need to divide this side by 900, cancel, divide this side by 900. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going to skip that one because there's not a lot of space. I'll come over here. Rustin, it says here, who has a mass of, Kilograms is a good number. Jumps out of a burning building down onto a sheet. It says here that he was it was held open by Lane and Connor with a momentum of 24 kilograms times meters per second. What is the impulse Rustin experiences to stop when hitting the sheet? Well, I know that impulse, which is J equals P, momentum. And if I know the momentum number over here, then I know the impulse number. So 24 kilograms times meters per second is the correct answer. No math needed. Let's keep going. It says here that a linebacker applies on impulse of, so they gave me the J value. Um, if the speed of the linebacker changed velocity by 4.7 meters per second, what is the mass, question mark, M of the velocity? I'm sorry, of the running back. Well, they gave us the J, and when it comes to impulse or the J, then impulse equals force times time. They didn't give me force and they didn't give me time. They actually gave me velocity and I'm looking for mass, but that's okay because I know that J equals P, I'm going to go ahead and say that J equals M times V, and I'm going to manipulate it this way. So I'm going to say 250 equals M times 4.7, divide by 4.7, cancel, divide by 4.7, the mass equals blank kilograms, okay? Let's keep going. It says that an ice skater who has a mass of 50 kilograms is traveling towards another ice skater with a velocity of 14.6 meters per second. Well, the second ice skater, okay, M2 now, and that's M1, has a mass of 40 kilograms and is traveling towards the first ice skater, so they're about to collide, I guess, into each other, with a velocity V2 of 22.75. Now, if the two run into each other and hold on to each other, what kind, that's a collision that looks like this, one plus one equals one new big one, right? One plus two equals a new big one. How fast will the ice skaters be moving after the collision? So I'm going to go ahead and write the momentum equation down, which is M1V1 plus M2V2 equals, and this is before the collision, M1V1 after the collision plus M1V1, sorry, 2, after the collision. But because after the collision it becomes one new object, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this out. But due to the law of conservation of momentum, I cannot cancel out the mass. I need to bring it over and say plus M2. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug this in and then you can do the solving. M1 is 50. The velocity to um, the first skater is 14.6 plus the mass of the second skater, which is 40. The velocity is 22.75 equals... The mass of the skater 1, 50, plus 40, skater 2 combined, times the velocity after the collision is what I'm looking for. Okay? You need to follow the, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. 
right? The law, um, the orders of operation. It has to follow that way. If not, you're going to get the wrong answer. Don't forget your velocity is going to be in meters per second. Let's go ahead and look at the next one down here. It says I have a skateboarder that's riding. So the skateboarder has a mass and a skateboard has a mass. So that's M1 and M2. Now the skateboarder is on the skateboard and they're riding together with one velocity before the collision. Now the skateboarder falls off of the skateboard and his skateboard moves at a velocity. The skateboard is number two. So that's going to be V2A after the collision. How fast was the skateboarder moving? V1A after the collision? Question mark. So let's go ahead and let's look at this. This is what we call an explosion because I start off with one object, I have a collision, and I end up with two objects afterwards. Let's go ahead and write out our formula, or I'm sorry, the yeah, the equation M1V1 plus M2V2 before the collision equals M1V1 after the collision plus M2V2 after the collision. But due to the law of conservation of mass, because this is only one object over here on the left side, I'm going to have to cancel this out, carry the mass over, and say plus M2. So let's go ahead and fill this in so that way we can answer this. Oops. 55 plus 7.5 times 18.5 equals 55. Now this is number one, the skateboarder, and I'm looking for his velocity. So I'm going to put V1A because that's what I'm looking for, plus the mass of the skateboard, which is 7.5. Remember, the masses will stay the same, times the velocity of the skateboard after the collision when he falls off is 12.5 meters per second. So let's go ahead and make sure you follow the orders of operation. Add that, multiply it by this. Multiply those two numbers, subtract it on this side and that side, and then do your division. Please take your time and follow the orders of operation. Let's keep going. I'm going to do a little bit here and a little bit on the next couple of pages, and then I'm going to pause and be done because I know that we just got through doing the wave, and so I know that you can do the last two pages because we just talked about that. So let me go ahead and do this one some of the next two pages and then that's about it the rest is up to you it says here that miss wren is lifting a 12 kilogram box from the floor to the distance of 0.75 now she carries it the box across the floor carries is a key word because over here she lifts it 50 meters at a constant speed of 2.2 to the other side of the room and puts the box up on a shelf that is 2.5 meters from the floor. Oh, that's another distance. How much work or net work, which means add, did Miss Wren do? So let me go ahead and visualize this. She picks a box up, she carries it across the room, and then she puts the box up even higher. That's how I see it. So from here, this picture, right here, there's no work being done, but there's work done here, and there's work done here is what I see. So let's go ahead and let's look at this. The equation for work is force times distance. So for the first part here, she's going to have, for this part, and then that part's number two, force Oh man, they didn't give us force, but that's okay though. They gave us the mass, and I know that F equals MA. So if I get the mass of 12 times 9.81, I'm going to go ahead and find the force number. So let's do that first. I'm going to say, what was that? 12 times 9.81. That comes out to 117.72 newtons. So the force of 117.72 times the distance of 0.75. Okay, you're going to get a number. 
that's our part one. Let's look. Part two is, or this middle part is zero. But the next part though, the shelf is actually located at a distance of 2.5 meters above the ground. But because she already has lifted it at 0.75 meters, and my shelf is 2.5 meters above the ground, let's find the difference first of 2.5 take away 0.75. Why is that? because if she's already lifted it this distance, we don't need to add that distance to this. So let's look at that. 2.5, sorry, subtract 0.75 equals 1.75. So now in this second part, do you see how I drew it, this arrow down here and this arrow up here? Because now she's only gonna raise it a distance of 1.75 now. So now this will be 117.72 is still going to be the force multiplied by 1.75 equals, I'm going to get a number here. We're going to get those two answers and add them together. So this one plus this one equals my answer. Okay, what does the SI unit for work? It's a joule. Okay, so there was many steps to that problem. I think that was a really good problem to do. Let's keep going. I'm going to skip down here to number four. There's a businessman, it says, who's pulling a briefcase. Here's the mass from his car to the actual, to the airplane for a distance of 38 meters at a theta of 28 degrees. How much work, question mark, work did he do? Now don't forget our work equation. Work equals force times distance, okay? Work equals force times distance. But it doesn't say anything about a theta. If they give you the theta or the degrees, you need to remember it's the cosine. It's always the cosine. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Work equals force times distance times the cosine of the theta. But they did not give us a force number, so we're going to have to do that first. F equals MA, or 30 times 9.81. So 30 times 9.81 equals 294.3 newtons. So let's plug that in, 294.3 times a distance of 38 times the cosine of 28 degrees. Okay, go ahead and find out what your answer is going to be. It should be in joules once you get your answer. Let's turn the page and let's keep working a little bit more and then after that you are on your own. Pull out your old notes, pull out your old test reviews, pull out your old um, homeworks, quizzes, so that way they can help you out. The next one says here, calculate the kinetic energy of this truck. Well, kinetic energy, Ke, equals 1 half mv squared, or 0 0.5 times 2900 times 55. Please do not forget to square the 55. Your answer? is in joules. Let's keep going. An egg dropped from the third floor window and lands on a foam rubber padding without breaking. Now if the egg has a mass of 0.062 and it falls for a distance of 8.5 meters, how fast was this egg moving right before it hits the ground? Well, they want to use velocity and velocity is actually part of the kinetic energy equation. Okay, but I don't have enough information to use that equation. So let's go ahead and we know due to the law of conservation of energy, the amount of energy I start off first is going to equal the amount of energy at the end. And so before this egg falls off of this building, it has potential energy up here. So we're going to use that equation, PE 
equals MGH. And so that way we can find the total mechanical energy up here, which is going to equal the total mechanical energy down here. So let's do that first. That's going to be step one. So the mass is 0 0.062, 9.81 times 8.5 equals, go ahead and plug those numbers in. I got 0 0.062 times 9.81 times 8.5 I'm getting an answer of 5.1 I'm gonna round it to 7 now that is my potential energy and at that moment before the egg falls the velocity is zero so all of this right now is just nothing but the total mechanical energy so when that egg falls and hits the ground right at the moment it's about to impact all of that potential energy got converted into kinetic energy. So at this time, now we can say that the Ke equals one half mv squared or 5.17 equals 0.5 and the mass stays the same, it does not change, times the velocity squared. Please don't forget to square root that at the end, okay? So I have it set up for you. All right. It says here that a, how fast is a ball rolling if it contains this much Ke and it has a mass of this? So if the Ke equation is one half mv squared, then I can say 98 equals 0.5 times the mass of four times velocity. Please don't forget to square root that. Go ahead and solve for that. It says here on number eight, a spring has a force or a spring constant of 500 newton meters. That's the K value. What is the potential energy stored in this spring if it's compressed at a distance of 0.04 from the equilibrium? So PEE equals one half K D squared. So we can plug in 0.5 times 500 times 0.04, it must be in meters, and square it. Our SI unit is a joule. Now it says here, using the same spring above, what is its potential energy when it's actually compressed only a distance of 0.03? So we're going to use the same equation, the same numbers, but we're gonna change the distance to 0.03 and we're going to square it. There we go. And then how much potential energy does a spring have when it's at rest? Zero 